session. And the next portion of our program is something we've already heard a whole bunch of, of talk about. In fact, in our regenerative farming discussion, it seemed there was a lot of interest in talking about carbon credits. So I think it's great that we have the chance to do a longer talk about carbon markets, um, since this is the one of the hot topics of the day. I'd like to welcome Megan Miller, who is the business development manager at Moore and Warner Ag Group, who is one of our generous sponsors today of this summit. Megan is a graduate of Eastern Illinois University, where she received her bachelor's degree in environmental biology. She went on to get her master's degree in plant pathology from NC State, and she previously was the Ag Innovations Manager at the Illinois Soybean Association. She will be welcoming our guests, and I'd like to thank them for their expertise that they will share today. Thanks, Megan. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here this afternoon. As Laura said, my name is Megan Miller, and I am the Business Development Manager at Moore & Warner Ag Group. Um, before we introduce our panelists, I thought it would be helpful to do a quick overview of what this carbon market framework looks like. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. At the top here, we have carbon market registries. And these registries are responsible for setting the protocols and the standards that people who are sequestering carbon have to follow in order to receive a carbon credit. So they pick the practices, they kind of are the deciders of what farmers will have to do in order to sequester carbon on their farm. So they have done work and discovered things such as reduced tillage, cover cropping, and crop rotation can help sequester carbon, especially um, in agricultural soils in the breadbasket. Once this has occurred and the farmer has um, implemented these practices, a verification process occurs and the carbon um, registry can issue a carbon credit, which a corporate buyer is then able to buy. However, um, the fee structure is set up so that it's not super easy for an individual farmer to be able to um, participate directly with a carbon registry, which brings us to our um, first panelist today, um, which is Chris Harbert from Indigo, and Indigo acts as a carbon aggregator. So they follow the registry standards for sequestration and they work with farmers across the country to implement those different practices and sequester that carbon. Our next panelist, Emma Fuller from Granular, um, their company works with farmer data collection and data management. A big part of this is providing the proof that these practices occurred. And as we've heard a lot about today, that happens with data. Um, so Granular works really hard to make that collection easy for the farmer. And then um, work done by Dr. Guan um, at Aspiring Universe and in his lab with remote sensing allows um, verification of that practice implementation and potentially even carbon sequestration measurements, which I'm excited to hear a bit more about. Um, and with that, I would like to go ahead and have our panelists introduce themselves. I'll stop screen sharing. Um, Emma, do you want to kick us off with a quick introduction about your role at Granular? Sure. I'm Emma. I'm the Director of Sustainability Science at Granular Corteva. Um, my purview is sort of to look for strategic opportunities where we can help farms get rewarded for documenting and demonstrating their stewardship. So carbon markets is something that rapidly emerging, but um, a, a really exciting opportunity where we can see a lot of value for farms that have already digitized their management practices to be able to prove sort of credibly with high rigor the practices that they're already doing, which can then feed into these markets to get rewarded for their stewardship. So excited to be here and excited to dig into all the details. Uh, maybe a little bit background, um, PhD in ecology, data science, so really coming at it from the number side of things that I've been working um, on the software as, as sort of that data science role before working in sustainability. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hey, hey everyone. Um, Chris Harbert. I'm the global head of carbon for Indigo. And we're really working to bring high quality carbon credits to, uh, to agriculture. So thinking of it as a, a new asset class and thinking of all the way from the buyers who are um, really driving the demand for the credits at a very high quality, um, all the way through to the connection to farmers and really focusing in the middle portion as some of the graphics show about pulling all of the different pieces together and making sure that all parties involved agree that the carbon credit is, uh, is strong and solid. 
Awesome, thank you so much. And Dr. Guan, do you wanna round out the introductions? Hey, hello everybody. Thanks for the invitation and uh, Kyle here. And uh, I, uh, uh, the, the better, better introduce myself. I think I, I'm always carrying two hats. Uh, depends on the situation, I need to clearly differentiate. Uh, in this case, I, I think I can represent both. Um, so first I'm a Blue Waters professor uh, at the University of Illinois. And then so uh, my lab developed a lot of technology related to using uh, process-based models, supercomputers, and the satellite remote sensing, airborne hyperspectral remote sensing to uh, understand the farm scale um, dynamics in terms of carbon, nutrient, water. Um, um, and then so uh, over the time, there are a lot of applications and innovations generated through my university lab and and um, and then university uh, technology office, you know, find the intellectual property and uh, and uh, and then so uh, some of the technology and actually majority of the technology has been licensed through uh, UBI technology office to a company that I co-founded called Aspiring Universe. And that's what uh, Megan uh, mentioned uh, in the slide. So Aspiring Universe is a company that uh, uh, is uh, in the research park uh, and a tenant of uh, Enterprise Works. And then uh, Aspiring Universe uh, focus really on, um, you know, uh, Aspiring Universe is a shareholder, you know, U, U of I is a shareholder of Aspiring Universe and Aspiring Universe is currently uh, really focusing on developing Technology uh, with one of the you know uh, product really serving for uh, targeting at uh, provide uh, accurate quantification at the field scale in a scalable way for carbon credit. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so the first question I have, and I kind of like each of you to take a stab at it, is um, why now? What has changed that is allowing carbon markets to flourish and agriculture to participate compared to past attempts? Um, Chris, do you want to kick us off with that? Yeah, happy to. Uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of like three things I can think of that, that I think are probably really interesting to the majority of, of the people on the call here, too. It's just there's been a significant and kind of sustained buyer demand for them. Right? It's always always think look for the customers. Right. There's certainly groups who are very interested in agricultural carbon credits overall. And then I think recently we've we've shown and, and have, have worked with both the um, Climate Action Reserve and VERA that there are new implementable methodologies that can actually leverage the great work that a farmer can do in a field and turn that into registry approved demonstrable carbon credits. That's a very new thing. You know, those protocols first came out in, in October of last year. So that's a new kind of move. And then just overall technology and what we're able to do, some of the things Caillou I'm sure we'll talk about are just bringing down the costs of measurement. Because if the cost of measuring the carbon credits is greater than the dollars you can receive for the carbon credits, it's an upside down market. So there's just been a, a host of new technologies that have really allowed um, companies to start to think about carbon crediting. Awesome, thank you. Caillou, do you wanna follow up with that on the technology side? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah. In particular, I think uh, the technology has arrived to a time that uh, we there are a lot of a uh, lot of uh, you know startups or companies there uh, claiming that uh, they are able to do something related to quantifying carbon credit at the farm scale. Uh, and in, in particular, I, I just want to briefly break that out. Is uh, there's a there's a so-called carbon sequestration, which is a take carbon from the atmosphere to the ground to increase uh, you know, soil organic carbon. So that's one type of effort. And the other effort is to reduce the uh, greenhouse emission. And then in particular, if you improve uh, your fertilizer application, uh, um, and then you, you, you in general can possibly reduce, uh, for example, nitro oxide N2O uh, emission, which is a, a very, very potent uh, greenhouse gas emission, uh, greenhouse gas. And so uh, this type of technology, I would say, you know, really evolve uh, faster in the, over the past few years. Um, but what uh, I think still the key question here is, could this technology be able to be accurately do at the field scale and uh, in a scalable way? Like you can do that in a field scale accurately, but can you do that for all the fields, millions of fields in the Midwest, in the, in the US or, or globally? Um, and then, so I think that that is really, uh, uh, I see that as the kind of the technology uh, threshold that to really enable the carbon credit market. And I will say that if you set the bar in this way, there will be very few or very limited technology actually being able to do, able to do that. And so, um, you know, uh, 
I, I definitely will want to talk more about my technology, but you know, based on, I think uh, our technology is one of the field that really fall into that category. But the, remember, I want to use two keywords. One is scalability, scalable. You have to have a solution that's scalable. And, and then you have a uh, scalable also include the cost effective. And then you also have to have the solution at the field scale, accurate at the field scale. So I will stay here now. Thank you so much. And Emma, what is your perspective on this? Yeah, I think to Kai's point and both to Chris on the tech side, um, the other thing that's changed, right, is farm management software, which granular is one type of that, right? So farms are already digitizing their farm management data on their tillage, on their yields, on their planting dates, all of that stuff to make their own management decisions. And we've seen there's a long way to go to make these, the software even better, but we've seen tremendous uh, adoption of that. And that's the same data that you need for um, reporting to and submitting often to these carbon registries. So it's a two for one deal, right? This carbon gets to be one layer on top of already digitized um, operation. And that's really different than where we were, say, in 2008 with the, car the Chicago Climate Exchange, right? So to Chris's point about the cost of measurement and verification, if you're able to digitize and remotely sense some of these practices and verify, that tremendously brings down the cost of verification, which is huge. So more of that value goes to the farm. And this only works if farms get rewarded for their, their outcomes, if it's not taken up by the folks in the middle in between the farms and the buyers. So just really definitely underscore that. Awesome, thank you. And that leads me perfectly into my next question is what determines the price of a carbon credit? Um, Emma, do you wanna go ahead and kick us off with that one? Since you were sure, and then I will turn it over to Chris to correct me. Um, <laughs> the, so what we see from our vantage point is really, it goes down to rigor. Um, so how well you can verify that truly that carbon was sequestered. So to Caillou's point, I think he alluded to this, you know, a lot of um, what we're doing, some of it is empirical measurement, especially around soil organic carbon, but some of it is also model based, right? So we're forecasting and quantifying based on the environmental covariates, the soil, the weather, the practices that happened, and those models themselves have some amount of error. So the more that you go model based, generally, I think the lower rigor you have because you have higher uncertainty, right? You can say in general, yes, probably there was sequestration, but I can't tell you that there was 2.75 tons of carbon, right? So as we get improved on that precision level, I think the price tends to go up because the quality goes up. You can be more sure that you were able to actually sequester that amount of carbon. But Chris, I would turn it over to you to correct me. Yeah, you know, it's it's a, no, thank you. I mean, it's it's very much like a, we, we see the, I mean, let me talk a little bit about the price of carbon, at least of what it's, what it's going for today. You know, and, and we're in the early stages of market and a distinction here, there's a voluntary market that we're operating and talking about here and there's a compliance market. So what, what Emma just talked through was very much the pathway to high quality credits, very well documented, the growers working in the right way to create those to that high quality. That is a pathway to a compliance market, and the price of carbon credits in a compliance market are, are much higher. There's a California compliance market right now in forest credits and others. So we we see the uh, the whole industry moving in that direction. But you know, companies are all over the place, right? We we've done a lot of deals for carbon in the twenty dollar a ton range. Um, others are looking upwards of uh, 60, 80, $100 a ton in the future of where they believe it's going. So there are a number of companies who are saying, I I'm, I'm getting long in this, right? It, from a trading perspective, like I'm going to buy today knowing that the price is going to go up. And that's super powerful because the more interest that we have in buying the credits up front, the more that we can go to farmers and say, this is real. There's money here for you. Like you're, you're about to change your operation in a significant way document the heck out of it in software like granular, right? And then the next thing you're going to do is, is get paid for it, but only if these buyers are really there. So we're certainly seeing the buyer demand and what we expect to emerge is a tradable asset, a tradable market out of this, where they'll be traded just like a commodity corn or soybean crop, for example. So. Awesome. And to follow up on that, this was actually a question that came from one of the panels earlier um, from Eric Jackson, but um, what, it, what do you think um, about the new CME carbon offset futures market and the impact that will have on agriculture credit pricing? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that if you'd like me to, Megan. I'm just, you know, in, in terms of it's really exciting to see, right? As soon as CME gets involved in, in, uh, in something, it means there's interest certainly from CME thinking about how do we actually make that into a tradable class. 
I'm, I'm a little concerned as you are with any new thing is, is there the volume of credits to trade to make uh, this really interesting? But it certainly is a line in the sand of saying very soon, we're gonna have a, a market. I'd love for that to emerge as some kind of index price for what carbon is. And then we can start to say then, okay, like a lower quality carbon credit might be trading 10 or $15 under. A high quality credit might be trading 10 or $15 over the index. So we'll see, you know, CME, I really applaud them for, for giving it a shot and getting it going. It's a super important step. Awesome, thank you. Um, and as we've heard today, you know, quality depends a lot on verification. And so I'd like to kind of move into that topic next. So um, yeah, starting uh, with Caillou, um, how does your work um, both in your lab and at Aspiring Universe approach the verification of practice changes and then potentially even carbon sequestration? Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, you know, one thing that I, I keep uh, uh, share with, uh, with our colleagues and, and then broader audience is uh, we should distinguish uh, two important concepts uh, which are different. One is called action, one is called outcome. Okay, so you know, action refers to you did some specific action in, in you know, in particular in this context, farming farmers start to do cover crop or start farmers start to you know, uh, transit from conventional tillage to um, a no-till system or, or they adopt you know, a smart nitrogen fertilizer application. Um, and, and so this is action, and and the action in in some cases you can. Uh, ask farmers, and then you can you can take uh, records, or sometimes you can even measure that from the satellite. For example, satellite has the technology to see whether you grow cover crop or whether you uh, have done what kind of tillage practice and the residual cover on the ground. So all these nowadays can be possible from the satellite, uh, from the airborne. Now these are action, but the action does not translate to carbon credit directly, uh, and then. What carbon credit really rely on uh, is so-called outcome, you know, outcome of these actions, and and then so and this is uh, you know echo what uh, uh, Emma previously mentioned, you know, uh, to able enable to convert the action to outcome usually require you know, you know some methods, some models, some calculations, and and then I will say that uh, uh, basically think about two things. One is how you verify the action, um, and then you know there's multiple technology uh, set, sensing technology. And, and then you know granular may have a, a big farmer base already can be able to do that, but then the outcome is a, is a directly translate to the carbon credit, translate to the carbon credit market, kind of a, a, you know what you are transaction uh, uh, rely on, and that part and that type of the technology I would say is is really the key, and I I also want to make a point that this type of the quantification of the outcome still I would say technology wise. Um, you know, a lot of people claim they can do it, but the, it's a very hard problem and, and they require a lot of effort and how you can really do that at, you know, cost effective, scalable way and then accurate at the field scale, because that's where you, you know, buy the carbon credit, transact the carbon credit and then transaction carbon credit. So uh, I think, you know, differentiate action to outcome, uh, you know, these two important concepts, they are different. And so really want to make sure that carbon credit rely on both and verification rely on both. And then so uh, a little bit about technology side, um, um, I, I, I would say that uh, there, there could be down the road, there could be you know, uh, uh, very powerful sensors uh, on the ground or cheap sensors do the job. But the, in reality, at this moment, if we want to do that right now, if we want to support the carbon credit right now, and then so the technology that you re rely on re really require a, a different things come together. And in our case, we what we really propose and funded by the ARPA inside my university uh, is through the U of I uh, lab is, uh, is really the technology that we bring the airborne hyperspectral satellite scale that up and then um, get the field scale insights and uh, measurements and integrate at the field scale with advanced models use you know, sophisticated you know, mathematical tools. And then usually that process is computationally you know, expensive. Now, how you do that to scale uh, and in a cost-effective way? One is you, you rely on you know, cloud computing or supercomputers to scale that. But another aspect is how you do that, you know, leveraging the uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning to really make that process smart and efficient. And then so uh, all these needs to stack together to come up with the solution that I, I, I said at the beginning re require you know, field scale accuracy, cost-effective, and then scalable. So, you know, I think uh, this is the solution that uh, 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 a mature carbon credit market need. And uh, yeah. 
Thank you. And that um, brings me to my next question. Um, Emma, on the granular side, how um, is granular farm management software helping farmers with the action of recording all this data um, and making sure it's in one easy place for verification? Yeah, so I think Caillou's uh, distinguishing between action and outcome is, is right on and really helpful. So uh, like all of those actions that are required for a carbon market, right? So what was the field activities that happened? All of them are collected already in granular. So machine data for your planting and your harvest maps, for fertility applications, crop protection applications, et cetera. All of those are, are collected and those are what end up feeding off in these models that are being constrained by sensors based on, um, depending on which modeling approach you're going with and which registry you're working with. So the, I think the, one of the biggest things, right, is that developing software that can both collect this data for carbon markets, but it also serves other purposes. Right now, I would say carbon markets, and there was a question in the chat, I think provide, um, money at this point to sort of de-risk and accelerate transitions, but there's not enough money in carbon markets to solely pay you if that's the only reason that you're transitioning today, right? It's part of like a collection of technologies and tools that can sort of accelerate this transition of which software like granular is one that helps serve many purposes, including carbon. So I would say that, you know, it, it, to Chris's point, it's wise if you're a farm and you're starting to think about making these changes to start documenting this, especially digitally, that will save you a ton of work down the road, regardless of what farm management software you choose. Granular is great, but anyone will work. Um, but again, sort of like documenting that, having that digitally is really important, but that should be hopefully able to help solve multiple problems on your operation rather than only carbon. So again, I think that sort of goes back to what's changed now is that a lot of things are flowing in the same direction that are, that are complementary to the carbon credits. Awesome, thanks very much. And we are also getting some questions in the chat around the concept of permanence as it relates to um, soil carbon. Um, so I guess the first question would be, um, Chris, do you wanna to explain to us the concept of permanence when it comes to um, carbon, soil carbon and carbon markets and how, um, how that impacts, especially agriculture? Yeah, so permanence is one of kind of four ingredients to carbon crediting. The first, and Kai, you talked a little bit about this. We've all talked about this. First one is realness. The credit has to be real. We, it's got to be documented data from growers that's right, that, that gets us all in the right frame of mind of trust that what they say they are doing in the field is actually happening and that I'm buying something real because you never deliver a carbon credit. So there's the realness thing. Then there's additionality. That's the new thing that you're doing in order to kind of qualify Permanence is that not only did, it, did you do a new thing, but you're going to continue to do it so that the effect on the atmosphere sticks around, right? And then the other one is this concept of leakage. And leakage is just you have to continue to farm it at a production level that's equivalent to what you're doing today. Otherwise, uh, you know, for example, you may have to burn down a rainforest somewhere else to produce the grain that you produced here if now you're reducing that. So it's sort of this global balance concept around um, around that leakage concept. So permanence is this big one of you've made a change, you're headed down this path. And to Emma's point, it's not just about the carbon credit alone, it's that you've made a choice as a grower to change practices, move to a, a, a regenerative style, cover cropping, no tillage, those sorts of, of techniques, depending on where you are, right? Depending on your soils, your conditions, all of it varies locally. But that permanence element is really saying it's gonna stick around. So. In the, in the context of the carbon program, the permanence guarantee is that you are engaging in a contract, you're getting paid for a carbon credit, you're getting paid to store it in the soil, and you're getting paid to make sure it stays there for a long time through the behavior change. So to me, permanence is guaranteed in agriculture really by the farmer making a choice that's more profitable. So if we can demonstrate through software and through the practice changes that this thing that they're doing is actually a better outcome financially and for their small business and for the environment, it's going to be permanent. It's going to stick around. So that's, I think, the way in which agricultural carbon credits guarantee permanence in a forestry credit permanence concept is like, the, don't cut down the trees for 100 years. That makes it permanent. In ag, since it's more actively managed, it's a little more complicated to think through what permanence means. But I think if you think of it in that context of, of definitely um, economically um, permanent for the grower, then, then we get the environmental permanence that we're all looking for. Thank you. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Um, and Caillou, to follow up on that, we have a question about satellite technology and whether or not it is able to solve for outcome measurements to prove additionality and permanence. Yeah, so I, I also gonna, you know, still go back to my previous point of uh, action and outcome. And then so 
a lot of the action related to additionality. Um, you know, like Chris said, uh, explained additionality means that new action, new, 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 new farming practice that you adopted, which is different from the past. And these type of activities, if it's related to cover crop and tillage, yes, you can measure that, you can observe that. Um, and then the similar thing, you know, permanency for, you know, regarding permanence, regarding the action, then you want to see that whether there's a certain action that continue uh, in, in during, you know, in a certain period of time. So, um, so for example, cover crop tillage, I mentioned this, this can be observed in terms of action from the satellite. Uh, not necessarily, you know, nitrogen, nitrogen application because it's, it's very hard to observe from the satellite. Now, if it goes to outcome, that's a different monster. And then so the so so the when you when you think about outcome, basically we are talking about like additionality. Uh, if you take a, a certain action, like you if you grow cover crop, if you convert from conventional tillage to no till, what's the carbon benefit? What's the carbon credit uh, you have? Uh, and, and then that's the outcome of that additional action. And uh, that to require a much more sophisticated approach. Basically, in our situation, we use models. We use models. We integrate satellite data. And then we use AI and 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 usually run that in the you know uh, cloud computing clusters to scale that up. So that's much more complicated. And then only satellite could not really do that job. And and then whether this type of the um, process continue uh, as a, as a you know sort of fulfill the permanence. This also go back go back to the fundamental science like the soil biogeochemistry it involves uh, you know respiration microbial activities. Does the science support the the permanence of uh, of that uh, specific outcome uh, of uh, of certain additionality? And and so um, I will see that it's uh, satellite is useful for you know capture the additionality and permanence in, in in terms of action, but not necessarily for for the outcome. Outcome require much more sophisticated approach. Thank you very much. Um, and another word, kind of buzzword, that all of you brought up in this answer um, is the concept of additionality. Um, and I know when I've talked to different farmers about that, there's kind of been concern that early adopters of some of these regenerative techniques have, are not able to participate in these markets. So um, Chris, would you be able to speak a bit to additionality and how maybe an early adopter would be able to participate in a market like this? Yeah, well, I, I think it's good to kind of think through when we look at all of agriculture, these regenerative practices, cover cropping, no tillage, really, they're they're on the low end of adoption. You know, cover cropping is maybe 5% of acres. So when we look at the and saying, look, we want to make a change across all of US agriculture to, to really meet the climate challenge of, of what our generation's facing, you know, okay, well, if we're going to do that, we've got to address the 95% and really try to figure out how do we move conventional agriculture to a more regenerative style. So there's a great opportunity for those farmers. But I think, Megan, what you're pointing out is there's a number of diehard no-tillers that started in the 1970s, and they have seen just fantastic benefits. When, when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they're like, Chris, it's unfair farming. Like, I, my neighbor's going to go out of business, and it's just flat unfair that I get to farm this way, and I don't know why they don't catch, catch a clue. So our, our hope is that you know, they can be, those who are already using those practices can be the mentors and the programs for the rest of, of agriculture as it transitions. But when, when you really start to talk to those growers who've been doing this stuff for a long time, they have a view of like, well, I'm doing everything I can. And when you sit down and talk to them, actually not. There are a few other things they could do. There's always a, a, a line of new technologies coming into the world that, that can be experienced and, and, and taken a look at. But even just Simple changes. Well, you're doing cover crop already. Great. What about a multi-species cover crop? What about actually starting to plant green where you use a roller crimper to knock the cover crop down and plant into that and terminate it after? You know, there's, there's some other things that there's always something else someone can do. So although it's not as big of a change as someone who's done nothing to all of a sudden now at this regenerative level, they may not earn as much from carbon right out of the gate. But, you know, down the road, I think we'll have other things for them too. We'll have um, low carbon grain, you know, that's just like an organic standard. Are people going to really say, look, I only want to buy a product that's made with ag agricultural products that are low carbon. Um, maybe we can pay growers a few more pennies a bushel for something like that. So I think there's an opportunity for everyone in, in and around carbon, but the benefits go far beyond just the carbon payment, as Emma pointed out. That's only part of it. That's like the cherry on top of what you have to do over your entire operation. I would just underscore 
just really quick, I think I think it's a totally fair concern, right? And this is one of the the first really large scale incentive changes, and it is not going to be the right program for everyone. And trying to fit everyone into the program is just it is, it's not going to work. But I think that low carbon grain and the carbon intensity score is something that early adopters excel at, right? They are ones that have already they're not experimenting they're not beginning in these practices they're not making mistakes they've sort of got a well-oiled machine for how they do these practices um and and thus if suppliers are looking for low carbon intensity grains they're going to be the, the first in line right they're going to rather work with someone who's been a diehard no-tiller since the 80s rather than someone who just started last year so again those are not like you know as far advanced as carbon markets and it's worth acknowledging that but i think again there will be like chris said um a focus there will be room for everyone in this carbon carbon space hopefully awesome i appreciate that there's always opportunity for continuous improvement and emma while i've got you here um we've had a question come in from the audience about um data data ownership security and privacy um and being approached by various players in the carbon market would you be able to speak to that a little bit yeah, so it's always worth looking for all of these um, programs that you sign up for. It's always worth looking at the data privacy and uh, transparency portions of those, those those agreements. For us, we when you use put your data into granular, you own that data, right? And you we would need your permission to share that data with any third parties. So for us, right, your data is your own. You can take it where you want. Um, and that's also true. I mean, so for these carbon markets, I think a lot of them need the data in order to verify the actions that you took to Caillou and then also to quantify the outcomes. So there is a lot of data transfer, which is why it's wise to have your data digitized in the first place. But yes, um, I think it's worth taking a look. And um, certainly for us, yeah, the data is your own. You give us permission and then we'll share it and we'll make it easy to share, but um, you have to give us that permission. Awesome, thank you. And we are getting close to the end of time. So I'd like to wrap up with um, a question for all of you, um, which is where do you see these markets going maybe five or 10 years from now? Um, Emma, do you wanna kick us off? You're still first on my screen, so. Yeah, um, I mean, we hope that we see sustained demand and sustained support for farms getting rewarded for their stewardship outcomes. Um, and sort of whether that's through voluntary carbon markets whether or not farms can participate in regulatory markets, all of those things, that's what we hope for. We also hope for really rigorous uh, and like very high accurate measurements of outcomes, right? So that farms that are doing really great jobs are rewarded more than farms that are doing moderately good jobs, right? So that really pushes the entire system to get better and, and rewards them for doing so. So that's what we're hopeful for is, is strong buyer demand, continued improvement in the science and quantification um, and improvements just in the whole, whole farm experience. So this is an easy um, and low cost uh, program to to enroll in as a farmer. Awesome, thank you. And Caillou? Yeah, I, I will. Uh, I would go even. Uh, I think uh, you know, to me, you know, carbon credit is really an uh, important measure of uh, sustainability. But I want to even go even broad because it, it, there's also water quality. There's also other ecosystem services that are extremely critical. But at the same time, you know, farmers uh, rely on uh, productivity for long crop yield, uh, and for the, the the you know economics is really needs to work. So what I envision is. Uh, you know, especially from the technology perspective, can we push the technology boundary in the next few years to really achieve a point that we can, you know, have high productivity, but also increase uh, the resource use efficiency um, and, and then make the environment uh, more, you know, sustainable, uh, you know, either from the carbon perspective, from the nutrient, you know, perspective, uh, uh, you know, general sustainability ecosystem service, you know, perspective. I think that's uh, you know, in the five, 10 years, that's really the opportunity that we can bring this up. And then to achieve that, you know, it's a it's an integration of different technology, um, you know, precision ag, sensing and, uh, you know, modeling, all these integrated together. So, you know, that there's a lot of opportunities in the research world in the you know, overall, I feel it's an exciting time. Awesome. And Chris, do you want to wrap us up? Sure, happy to. I mean, you know, when you think out five to 10 years in, in this carbon space, there's such an opportunity for agriculture in the next five to 10 years. The technology we're talking about here is photosynthesis. It's here, it's real, it's just about scaling it. So if we can start to impact this, and the US is the first market that we're all looking at, there's great opportunity. US farmers are lifelong experimenters. We're hopeful that they really get excited about what we're doing in this new form, form of revenue coming to them to the farms. But then I see really expansion to other other areas of the globe. Um, and and really, my, my hope in five to 10 years is the growers not just thinking about their primary crop, 
and they're, they think of themselves as a corn or soybean farmer, but they're thinking of themselves as a carbon farmer too. And I think when we get to that place, um, then it, it becomes part of the revenue stream, part of their lives, part of the ecosystem, and you keep farmer at the center of it and everyone's gonna benefit because they're such great people. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to see how these things progress and thank you to all of our panelists for, for joining us today.